Thank you, Julie. Take your Bibles. Take your Bibles. Let's stand. First Timothy two. Same verse we read this morning. Then we'll go to over to Ephesians. Who loves the Bible? Amen. Who's glad they're saved? Amen. Who's glad they belong to a church? Amen. I wouldn't trust I wouldn't trust a church hopper. People that go from church to church and don't join one. Those are people that do do, do not want to be accountable to God. They just do what they want to do. I'm glad I'm a member of the church. Amen. I can be faithful to God. Church. He shed his blood for the church. So church is very important. Church is not your building. Church is not a denomination. In church, it's a bunch of saved people getting together saying amen and winning souls and studying the Bible and being used by Jesus Christ. That is his method. Amen. Thought I'd slip that in there. I don't know why the Holy Spirit had me say that. I guess someone needs it. First Timothy two, verse five. See, if you don't go to one church, that means you don't have to tithe. Nobody knows if you're giving or not. No accountability. No ledger. God's into accountability. Are you accountable? If you don't go to church, that means you don't have to show up for soul winning. Nobody knows you. That's the way you want it. Anyway. I don't know why I said that. I guess the Holy Spirit. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. See, if you don't go to... No, I'm just kidding. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. For there's one God, one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. Ephesians. 317. Ephesians 3.17. We could preach on this subject for weeks. What I'm preaching about today. That's why I'm taking tonight too to, to really keep going with it. Although I have no points tonight. Um, I guess I have a lot of points, but without number one, two, or three. You'll get it once I get going. 317, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. So when you get saved, Jesus is in your heart. Yeah, people make fun of us when we say, do you have Jesus in your heart? What are you talking about? Well, we're talking about what the Bible says. He comes and dwells in your heart. He can be everywhere. He can be on the throne. He's on my present. He can be in your heart. What a great God. We were talking about, me and somebody were talking about our first day in heaven. That was incredible. It's going to be because our, we'll have a perfect mind and we'll be able to see how great, how great and how fortunate we are to be saved. We take it for granted. That's just the way we are. That's the way our flesh is. We take it for granted. But try to stop every day and thank him. <clears throat> Let's bow our heads and one of you guys come pray. Okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight for your infallible word, Lord. That word that by which we, if we sow into our heart, Lord, the same heart by which you are in, Lord, we can become new creatures in Christ. Lord, thank you for the great opportunity to be part of the body of Christ, Lord. Especially a body of believers like this, Father, who's hardworking and, and, and loves you with, with, a, with a passion and cares about others and shows that in their daily lives and their walks with you, Father. Bless the preaching now uh, and the singing as we glorify you in word and deed. 
Jesus' name, amen. God's grace is sufficient for me, for me. God's grace is sufficient for me. When it seems all hope is gone, he is high upon his throne, working out the plan he started in me. Even when the way is dark and I can't see very far, he the bright and shining light will be. I will worship and proclaim and give glory to his name, for his grace is sufficient for me. God's grace was sufficient for Elijah as he was standing there upon the mount. All the prophets of Baal, they began to scream and yell, but their God didn't even make a sound. Then Elijah prayed in faith like he knew that he should do, and the fire of the Lord did fall. It consumed the sacrifice with a single flash of light, and Jehovah God was worshipped by all. God's grace is sufficient for me, for me. God's grace is sufficient for me. When it seems all hope is gone, he is high up on his throne, working out the plan he started in me. Even when the way is dark and I can't see very far, he the bright and shining light will be. I will worship and proclaim and give glory to his name, for his grace is sufficient for me. God's grace was sufficient for Jonah as he was sitting in the belly of the whale. Oh, Jonah should have died, but the Lord kept him alive so that he would have a story he could tell. Then Jonah prayed in faith like he knew that he should do, and the fish came a-swimming to the shore. Well, he spit all Jonah out, and when Jonah hit the ground, he was preaching like he'd never before. God's grace is sufficient for me, for me. God's grace is sufficient for me. When it seems all hope is gone, he is high up on his throne, working out the plan he started in me. Even when the way is dark and I can't see very far, he the bright and shining light will be. I will worship and proclaim and give glory to his name, for his grace is sufficient for me. I will worship and proclaim and give glory to his name, for his grace is sufficient for me. Jigger bug or something, whatever it is. I love that song. God's grace is sufficient. I'll be singing that all night now. God's grace is sufficient for me. Let's sing it again. You want to? Come on back up here. No. no. Um, let me explain what I'm preaching about this morning because preachers always think people don't, don't get it, but most of them do. It's us that don't get it half the time. Uh, I want to use that example what I used this morning real quick to lay it all out, that uh, the man, do you, do you know somebody on the inside, especially? Uh, many of, who's got a job because you knew somebody? Raise your hand. You knew somebody. You knew a man on the inside, okay? I got that job, like I said, uh, this morning. This is a perfect illustration, I think. Uh, my dad knew when I got the job on the oil rig, which paid a lot of money back then. When Julie and I were just married. It was a miracle. Uh, but I got the job because my dad knew the guy on the oil rig. He had worked with him, and uh, he asked him. He said, uh, do you, you know, my, my son Keith, is uh, he's done with playing college baseball, and he's ready to get a job now. Is there an opening? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, you can send, send it to me. I'll give him a job. And I got there, and he gave me the job, and he asked me which drilling rig. So I knew a man on the inside, right, a man. But I also knew the man on the inside, okay. Actually, I didn't. I wasn't even saved. I was just thinking about that. Uh, but, you know, God knows he's got a plan for everybody. 
And he knew I was going to get saved. So he saved my life when I chose the oil rig that didn't sink three months later. And all those guys perished. He, he had me choose the one that would keep me alive. I had another man on the inside. Okay, so everybody knows what we're talking about? Okay, got a man. That's who we're talking about, Jesus Christ. It, 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 it pays to have know somebody on the inside. Um, we were created in the likeness and the image of God. Uh, but when sin entered in, we lost our likeness and similarity and our kinsmanship, what we were talking about this morning, kinsman redeemer. Uh, the reason you're taken care of is because you're God's kin, man. You're a child of God. Amen. He's my kin. But since Adam, Adam sinned, we lost that, our likeness, okay? And so he made the decision to come down and restore that likeness as far as us being saved and a child of God. Now, once we fell, we couldn't get back up, so he came down to us. Do you remember that story about baby Jessica? Years ago, a little girl that fell down a well, and her leg was over her head. Oh, it's just a heartbreaking story. She was down there for almost three days, and the news, and everybody they couldn't get to her, but they had lights on her. They would send water down to try to get her to drink. She was, I don't know how old she was. She was, you know, very young. Um, but it was, it was, it was, finally they got her out. And they thought she was going to be paralyzed with her leg, but she finally started walking. But that's a picture of us. We were down a well. We were in a pit, all twisted up in sin, and God reached down and got you. He came down. It's good to have a man on the inside. Yeah. I don't know what I entitled. The advantages of, of knowing somebody on the inside. Um, so that was us, deep in a hole and twisted up in sin. And he came and he, and he took care of us. You ought to thank him every day for that. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of miry clay and set my foot upon a rock and established my going. I, would, I think I, after, after church, I'll Google Jessica and see what she looks like and read her story. I, wonder if, I guess she's still alive. Uh, but God said, since you can't come up and be like me, listen to this, if you can't come up and be like me, I'll come down and be like you. Now, what God does that? <clears throat> the man Christ Jesus does that. He said, I'll come down and be like you without the sin, of course, since you can't come down or up and be like me. I'll come to you. He, get, he came down through 142 generations. He came, came down through the oracles of time. Through, he came down through the mouths of the prophets, the tabernacles and temples. He found a virgin named Mary and wrapped himself up in human flesh for us. He took up the form of a servant and began walking around with us and talking with us. God said, since you can't be like me, I'll become like you. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. This sounds strange to most churchgoers now because We've raised a generation of churchgoers, of carnal believers that come to church to get something from God. And, oh, God, yeah, I got to get this house. Lord, I got to get this job. Lord, I got to get a Cadillac. Lord, I got to get this and that. Today's generation comes to God not just to worship him because he's a great God, but to get stuff from him. I better go to church so God will bless me. Well, I got news for you. Your lungs are full of air. He's already blessed you. Amen. You're not taking a dirt nap like most people out there in the graveyard. You're alive. But before we were thanking God for gold watches, we were thanking God for his blood. The old time churches, they would thank him for his blood. And thank, uh, they would thank God that he washed away their sins. <clears throat> I'm ready to go back to that old time religion. 
Give me that old-time religion. Give me that old-time religion. Give me that old-time religion. It's good enough for me. It was good for the prophet Daniel. It was good for the prophet Daniel, so it's good enough for me. Oh, give me that. Oh, no. I love that song, man. You know what? The devil can mess with my car. He can mess with my marriage. He can mess with my health. He can mess with anything God allows him to do, but he cannot mess with my soul. I am going to heaven, no ifs, ands, or buts about it, because Jesus said I was. Amen. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And God cannot lie, so I have to go to heaven. He cannot take his word back. November 18, 1981, he made that decision, and he can't take his words back. I took him at his word, and I said, Lord, save me. And so I'm saved. I've been saved ever since. I don't know how much more life I've got, but I've lived 66 years. He's given me the grace and kindness and mercy to live that long when people don't live. People, babies are aborted. They don't even get born. Here you are living 40 years, 50 years, 70 years. 80, okay, man. I wasn't going to go there, but that's good. Jesus, I don't know if I want to live to be 80. I don't know. Jesus was the only high priest that went into the Holy of Holies without an animal to sacrifice. Of course, his Holy of Holies was heaven. Come on. The high priest would go into the Holy of Holies in the Old Testament and have an animal to sacrifice, and they were the only ones to go into the Holy of Holies. They'd pull the curtain, and the high priest was the only one to go, was able to go back there and present, it, present the blood uh, to God himself, because he was the offer. Jesus was the offer and the offering. He offered up himself as a living sacrifice for your sins and mine. Thank you, Lord. When he gave his blood, when he carried his blood to the altar in heaven and presented it to God the Father, your sins and my sins were no more. Amen. Like it never happened. But Jesus was the offer and the offering. He was the offering. He was the sacrifice. Had to be a sacrifice. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you what? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Jesus was a living sacrifice. He didn't need an animal. He didn't need a goat. He didn't need a, it's okay if I take this dime? No. He didn't need a, a goat. He didn't need a pigeon. He didn't need a dove. He was the sacrifice, a living sacrifice. And that's what God asks you to do on a daily basis, okay? Present your bodies a living sacrifice. What makes my God special was that he came where we were. We, as a church, that's why you love this church, we go where people are living. We don't say we can't pick you up because uh, you cuss or you smoke or you drink. No, we go where they are. Because we know we're not going to be able to change them, only Jesus will. Our job is just to pick them up and take, our job is to take people to Jesus. The Bible says we don't have a high priest that cannot be touched by our feelings, our infirmities. The man Christ Jesus feels every infirmity that you go through. He feels my heart ache. He feels when my heart's broken. He feels when I'm down. He feels when I, uh, uh, he knows how I feel when I let him down. If you're a sincere person, a Christian, and you blow it, you got to think how God feels about that. He's not judge, oh, well, I'm giving up on him. That's the 1,400th time that he did it and asked for forgiveness. What does Jesus say? Forgive them how many times? Yeah, eternity. 
Okay, as many times as it takes, he will forgive you. He knows your flesh. He knows we're bad. He knows all about us. Remember, he knows every thought we think. Tempted at all points, like as we are, he was, yet without sin. He knows about all that. He, was, he became sin. There's nothing that you're going through that God can't relate to. So don't get so down on yourself that you're going to be useless to Jesus Christ. That's what Satan wants. Satan, you know, God made Aaron who made the golden calf, okay? He made him a high priest, being the only one that can present the offering. So, so you're, you're, not, you're no worse than Aaron. Hello? You're no worse than Peter who denied him three times. Stop having your little pity part. You blew it. Get back up. Go back to church. Hello? Keep going. <clears throat> There's nothing worse than somebody representing you that can't relate to you or your struggle. A lot of lawyers can't relate to you. They just, they just want the case, and they see dollar signs. That's what they're there for. They're all scumbags. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, there's some good lawyers. In fact, when my wife went to prison, <laughs> jail, I mean, your attorney goes before the judge in your name. Don't miss it. He stands up for you. You don't stand up and give your name. The attorney stands up and said, I'm representing Keith Bell here, Julie Bell. <clears throat> Actually, when Julie went to jail, when we met, after she got out, we met with the attorney, of course, and we're thinking, oh, this guy's going to be a typical lawyer, you know, and I'm, oh, I didn't want to be in there. It turned out that we were sitting in his office downtown, real Dapper Dan looking guy, everything perfect. I'm thinking, oh, great. Well, we witnessed to him and told him who we were. He looked at us and said, man, I'm a believer too. And he said, my son, eight years old, I think it was, and he's dying of cancer. So he could relate to what we were talking about. Jesus can relate. And by the way, that taught me a lesson that I've had to be taught hundreds of times. Don't judge somebody by the, what they do and what they look like. Amen. You don't know their heart. You don't know what chapter of life they're going through. You don't know Amen. what they're going through. Uh, but Jesus always knows what you're going through. Uh, that means all, that all the issues referring to the plaintiff are you, if you're in court, or handled by your lawyer. Because your lawyer is representing, the lawyer represents the plaintiff. That same principle works in your prayer life. Whenever the devil, that devil wants uh, uh, to charge you, okay, with something, you don't have to stand for yourself. Jesus stands in your stead. He stands and says this, and don't miss this. He says, if you're calling Keith Bell's name, if you're calling Julie's name, you're calling my name. And if you're calling my name, you better be ready. Because I'm God wrapped in human flesh, my friend. And if you want to charge Keith Bell, if you want to charge Roy, if you want to charge Tony, then you are charging me. And good luck on that one. <clears throat> the man Christ Jesus. Do you have a man on the inside? Do you have a man who stands for you? And when the devil calls your name, he stands up. He represents, he's the great mediator between you. <clears throat> I know a man from Galilee. If you're in sin, he'll set you free. I like that. I like that. I don't know who said it, but I saw it. I know a man from Galilee. If you're in sin, he'll set you free. He'll make you free, actually. So we, we take Jesus' life at the age of 12 and pick it up again in the Bible at 30. From 12 to 30, the Bible is silent. You're going to learn about those years when you get to heaven. After 30, John the Baptist, he says, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. 
When the devil led him into the wilderness to be tempted, every time he was tempted, Jesus just said, it is written, it is written, it is written. You want to know anything? Satan, go to the Bible. Get you a Bible, amen? Get you a King James Bible. Jesus didn't need an attorney. He was the attorney. If Jesus can get himself out of trouble, then surely he can get you out of trouble. I can sit here all night and tell you stories of how he's gotten me out of trouble because I'm, my, 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 uh, what do you call it? What do you call uh, type A? Uh, my personality, I don't know what type it is, but I don't even know what type my blood is. But my kind of personality, I get into trouble quite a bit because I open my mouth too much or I go, you know, do something or say something. Or, uh, and so I need Jesus quite often as far as getting out of trouble. And some of you the same way. You don't have to be an A personality to get in trouble. Um, the Bible says they took your Savior from the judgment hall to judgment hall. They couldn't find anything wrong with him. Of course, Pilate said, I can't find anything wrong with him. They beat him. They scourged him. A weaker man would have died from the same beating. But Jesus, the attorney, the man, the man inside, he knew he couldn't die from the beating. He knew he couldn't die when, when the Roman soldiers beat him over the head, when they scourged him. He knew that. He was God. He had to be sacrificed on the cross. That's why he came. He couldn't die where Satan was trying to kill him. He held death off, and they hung him high and stretched him wide. But he still wouldn't die. He couldn't die until the high priest said so. The Roman soldiers didn't kill him. In fact, Pontius Pilate said, I find no sin with him. Why are you even here? And the religious people stepped up. Because he blasphemies the Old Testament. He lies about what, how we should live and who's God. And he says he's God. The Roman soldiers, they could care less. Okay? Pontius Pilate, the civilians, they could care less. It was the high priest. When he nodded, he said, yes, we'll, you, you can let Barabbas go and crucify this Jesus. Jesus could not die until he was a sacrifice. Not just taken and killed by some soldiers. He had to be a sacrifice. He was the living sacrifice. He's the one that was sacrificed for your sins and mine. He couldn't just die like anybody die. The high priest had to present him at the altar of the cross to God. Satan said, they got him now, but for three days, after three days, they had to stop the party. That Sunday morning, he got up and said, I am he that was dead, but now I am alive forevermore. When the high priest nodded to Pontius Pilate and said, crucify him, it became a sacrifice, not an execution. And when he did that, and when he was a sacrifice, that's when he died for the sins of mankind. Your Savior. Do you have a man on the inside? Do you have somebody you can go to 24-7? Do you have somebody that's God, that's the great eternity, attorney? Do you know the man? Do you have a man on the inside? The man Christ Jesus. The mystery of the Godhead is locked up in the man. The man. Never a man speaks like that man, the disciples said when he was walking with him. I think it was Andrew. He was walking after he, after he rose from the dead. And they spoke, and he, they were speaking to Jesus, and they didn't know. Hey, they were talking to Jesus, and they were saying, Hey, did you hear about this guy that rose from the dead? Yeah, this Jesus. They put him in a tomb, and everybody says he rose from the dead. And Jesus, oh, is that so? Oh, is that right? Okay, and then after Jesus left him, what did they say to each other? Never a man spoke like this man. There was something about him. The man, okay? And it also said, what manner of man 
is that even the winds and the waves obey his will. What, what manner of man is this? He snatched uh, the sting out of death. He took the victory out of the grave. He rolled the stone away. Jesus didn't get up and run into heaven like he was scared of the Roman soldiers after he, no. He hung around and walked around and visited with, with people for 40 days to prove himself. These guys, they call themselves apostles now. There's no apostles now. The only apostles in the Bible are those who saw him, physically saw him. After 40 days, he called for a cloud and said, come get me. And he went up to heaven, not as a ghost, not as a spirit, as a man. As a man. He could have been the first man in heaven that heaven ever saw. But if you remember, Enoch and Elijah were the first men that heaven ever saw, that the angels ever saw. Who is this? What is this? It's a man, okay? And when they saw Jesus, he was the God-man. But a man, nevertheless, okay? You're made in the image of God. So I, what I'm saying is when you see me, you see Jesus. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I don't know. He's a Jew. He's probably got olive skin, okay? And he doesn't look like the artist, okay, with the long hair and the robe and the sandals. We know that, okay? But he's, he look, the Bible says he looks ordinary, He's not particularly good looking or bad looking. He's ordinary. Aren't you anxious to see Jesus? Yeah. And Jesus is sitting there waiting for you and I to get into trouble. And then you call his name. He goes into active duty. Amen. He is your personal attorney. He stands up and says, did you call Keith's name? Because you called my name. He was sitting there until one of the deacons named Stephen got into trouble for preaching and call them a bunch of snakes, the religious people, a bunch of snakes and vipers. And when he heard Stephen preach, okay, and Stephen was being stoned, and Stephen looked up into heaven, he saw his attorney, Jesus Christ, sitting there. And then, no, he wasn't sitting there, was he? He stood up. He stood up because the religious people called Stephen's name, said, you're guilty, we're going to kill you. Jesus stood up, the Bible says, and looked over the portals of heaven and said, you called me? You called my name? And Jesus himself welcomed Stephen, the Bible says, into heaven. How'd you like that to happen to you? As soon as your brains get bashed out, you're with Jesus Christ because Jesus stood up for him. And then when they called Stephen, we judge you. You are a false prophet. Jesus is not God. Jesus stood up and said, I am God. Good job, Stephen. Come live with me forever. When hell is after you, the man will stand up for you. Not a church, not a religion, not a preacher, not a pope, not anything. God, man, the God, man. Jesus, the great attorney, will stand up for you. Oh, I want to give you some illustrations of how he stood up for me and my wife for, for, for years, for decades, the stuff we've been through. And there's stuff you, 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 that you went through that your attorney, Jesus Christ, got you out of. He stood up for you, didn't he? When it looked like nobody cared, when it looked like there was no hope, he stood up for you. When everybody else gave up on you, he didn't give up on you. And I'm trying to tell you, is when a man, a man couldn't be like God, God became like man. If you're waiting for the first, first point, there isn't any. I'm just talking about Jesus tonight. I'm just talking about how great he is, how good he is, and how great attorney he is. You know why he's the greatest attorney? Because he tells the truth. He always deals with the truth. Attorneys now, why you, why you call them scumbags and they're liars? Because they're liars. They lie to get the case. Most do. I'm sure there's uh, a good one out there somewhere. I haven't saw him yet, but anyway. The attorney we got that we talked about, he was a good guy yet. Okay. He charged us thousands of dollars still. 
okay? If he was a real good guy, he would have said, you know what? You guys are serving Christ. You go out of here and be good. I'm not charging you anything. Then I would have thought he was a good guy. <laughs> I was kidding. Let me, let me, I got three minutes. Then he told the church, Jesus, when you pray, don't use your name, use my name. I'm your attorney, I represent you. You're not going to talk to the judge. I talk to God the Father. I present your name. That's why we say in Jesus' name. That's why we're bringing this prayer in the name of Jesus, not Keith Bell, not Tony, not Fred, in Jesus' name. Because you have no power with the judge. Jesus does. So whatsoever you ask the Father, the Bible says, ask in Jesus' name. Do you have a man on the inside? Do you know somebody on the inside? He said, don't use my name in vain, too. Don't ever use my name in vain. And he didn't mean that just cussing, either. Boy, it's quiet in here. He said, don't call my name if you don't mean business with my name. So the people say, ah, oh, Jesus Christ. You ever hear that? Jesus said, don't do that. You're calling my name. There's nothing going on. You don't need me, all right? And you don't respect me. Be careful. Be careful about using his name when you're no, there's no business to use his name. That name is holy. That name is high and lifted up. Not just using his name in vain. Of course, I can't say that. Janine has said that. Julie's like, did you realize what you said? I was trying to make a point, honey. Oh, go to bed. Shut up. <laughs> his name is above all names. The name of the Lord is a strong tower, the Bible says. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and tongue confess. Don't ever, don't ever uh, be afraid to shout, Jesus! Jesus! <laughs> You go soloing with Joseph. You'll be in Lowe's or Home Depot or wherever Circle K, and you'll be witnessing somebody, and they'll blow him off, and he'll just come out and say, Jesus! <laughs> and I'll look back, and I'm out the door. I'm, <laughs> I don't know that name. No, I'm just kidding. I like that. I love that. I wish I could do more of that. And I've done it. I've done some things. All right, that, that I'm sure when I get to heaven, God will remind me and say, hey, I appreciate you doing that. I appreciate you standing up in the middle of a restaurant when somebody's using my name in vain and saying, hey, let's don't do that. Have you ever done that? Try it sometime. You think, oh, this, here's what you're thinking. When you hear somebody use his name in vain and you're in a crowd, Here's your first thought. Oh, I can't do that because it's going it's to turn out bad. It's going to, every time, me or anybody I know of has ever done that, Jesus took care of them. You don't think he's, that's his name you're standing up for. Is he real or not? Hello? I don't care if you go to jail. He's got a purpose for you to go to jail, to witness to somebody. Jesus stands up for you. Praise God. One more thing and I'm done. When Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says he rent the veil from top to bottom, not from bottom to top. If God said that, somebody would give man the credit. Man has no credit. God did it all. Jesus did it all, okay? <clears throat> now, let me just end with this and leave you with this for this week till Wednesday. Well, let me, uh, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Let me leave you with this. I think I got it. If I hadn't known somebody on the inside, I would have been swallowed up. Is that your case? If I hadn't have known Jesus Christ, if I hadn't have known somebody inside that I could go to in desperate times, 
when there was no friends, no family, nobody. Just had to go to him, okay? If it hadn't been for him, I would have been swallowed up. Praise God. Do you know the man? Do you have a man on the inside? Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for being not only God, but being a man. Thank you.